This video is going to continue our talk on lung physiology. We said in our previous video, um, your lungs have a tendency to collapse. Your lungs grossly and even uh, your small little alveoli. All your little alveoli want to collapse. Your alveoli want to collapse. And they want to collapse because they're elastic and also because your alveoli have a little bit of water around them and water groups together, surface tension. Yeah, that's why water kind of beads up. So it has surface tension. How do we get around this again? What do we make that stops our alveoli from collapsing? Our surfactant. So our surfactant is this compound that kind of breaks that surface tension, kind of lets it expand, keep open, does not collapse. So that's how we stop your alveoli from collapsing, but how about your lungs grossly? How do we stop these giant lungs from wanting to collapse? Well, your chest wall has a natural tendency to expand, expand outwards. And when it expands outward, expands out, and when it expands, it pulls things out. It pulls things out, kind of like a vacuum, it kind of sucks things out. It sucks things out. It has this negative pressure, this negative pressure that pulls things out, pulls things out. And what does it pull out? Well, what's attached to your chest wall? How about your pleura, your parietal pleura? And isn't that attached to your lungs? So it pulls your lungs out. It kind of balances your lungs' uh, desire to collapse. Your lungs want to, your lungs want to collapse, fall in on itself. That's positive pressure, positive pressure, pushing in on itself. So you have the negative pressure of your chest wall balancing with the positive pressure of your lungs. Okay, and that fine balance allows our lungs to kind of keep inflated, you know, stay up, not collapse on each other. So we can draw graphically on a graph. Here's, let's say pressure. Here's zero, here's negative pressure. Here's positive pressure. Here's volume. We said your chest wall spends most of its time in the negative zone, right? It wants to pull things out, suck things out, has that negative pressure. So it spends most of its time on the negative side, but then spends a little bit of time on the positive side. Your lungs, on the other hand, don't want to go on the negative side. It basically wants to collapse on itself, so it's mostly positive. If you balance the two, you get chest wall and lung, I think I call it like a chest wall and lung graph. If you balance the two, if you take two, the two and combine them, they look kind of like this, okay? So that's just graphically how they, how they want to demonstrate it. Now, when you're at zero pressure, when everything's resting and normal, everything's, you know, equilibrated, then your lungs are, are still. And when your lungs are still, there's still a little bit of air in them. We call it the functional, functional residual capacity. We're gonna talk about that when we're talking about spirometry a couple of videos later, but I just thought I'd mention it here. All right, so that is, that's your chest wall lung graph. Hopefully, hopefully it's not too bad. Let's move on to our next topic. We said when you breathe, air goes in, goes into your lungs, and that oxygen goes into your blood. How does it do that? How does it do that? Well, let's just draw out our lung anatomy. Let's just draw some lung anatomy. So you breathe into your trachea, your windpipe, and that branches into your bronchi, right? Your bronchi. And your bronchi branch into your secondary bronchi, tertiary bronchi. And our secondary, tertiary, and what do your bronchi branch into? Branch into your bronchioles, absolutely right, right? Branch into your bronchioles, and that becomes your terminal bronchioles. And what do your terminal bronchioles become? <laughs> I'm gonna keep repeating this until you get it right, okay? So it turns into your respiratory bronchioles. And your respiratory bronchioles, we say were special because they had a little alveoli. And your respiratory bronchioles eventually became your alveolar sac, which had a ton of alveoli. And it is that alveoli, that functional unit, that alveoli, that comes in contact with blood and exchanges gas exchanges gas. You breathe in oxygen, goes into your blood, oxygen, and then you breathe out waste products like CO2, CO2. You exhale it. That's it. All right, I'll be alive. Now, what factors come into play when we're talking about gas exchange? We're talking about diffusion. Uh, there's a ton of things that come into play. 
How about how big your alveoli is, surface area? Yeah, I guess the bigger, the more gas exchange will be. How about how thick your alveoli? How, we say alveoli have to be really, really thin. Otherwise, gas won't really exchange, just be too thick. So how thin it is, yeah? How about, how about uh, I guess, the concentration difference? If there's 100 molecules of oxygen here and there's zero over here, they'll want to diffuse. That's just like, that's just physics. That's just properties. Like, if um, you have 100 molecules stuck in this corner, and you release all those molecules so one of the fuse out into where there isn't a high concentration. All right, so you have all these factors coming into play. They're kind of intuitive, but um, the step likes to complicate physio with things like equations, things like charts. So let's look at the equation for diffusion. The equation for diffusion, diffusion is, let's just write it out first. This. So A equals surface area. The more surface area you have to diffuse, the greater your diffusion. Just kind of mathematically works. Uh, this P, change in P, is the difference in concentration, difference in pressure. So, blah, 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 P equals difference in pressure. It's basically concentration. T is the thickness. We said if it's very, very thick, you can't diffuse. And so if you have a big denominator, then mathematically you have a lower number. You have less diffusion. If it's really, really, really thin, that's what we want. If it's really, really thin, then we have a ton of diffusion. All right. So T equals thickness. And so you can kind of mess around with these variables and kind of mess around with diffusion. That Hopefully that's not too bad mathematically. Now I skipped over one thing. I skipped over D. What the heck is D? Gases, all different type of gases have their own, I guess, uh, natural ability to diffuse. Some gases diffuse quicker than the others. Uh, some gases diffuse slower. That's just an inherent uh, natural characteristic of the gas. Right? So, so some gases diffuse a lot quicker. Some diffuse really, really slowly. So let's just take this and look at it in a little bit more detail. So let's draw our capillary out in our blood. Now some gases like CO2, like N2O, diffuse immediately. Diffuse immediately. We'll say you're breathing in 40 molecules every second. I don't know. We're just making up units here. It will diffuse as soon as it touches your capillary. As soon as it touches your capillary and equilibrate. Equilibrate. Okay. So let's just draw it out graphically. You start low, but then it diffuses immediately and then kind of equilibrates. The thing that limits how much of these gases get into our body isn't going to be diffusion. It diffuses immediately. The thing that limits it is going to be how much blood we can send over here. All right, so if we can send more blood and clear more blood out, keep sending blood, then we can keep picking up molecules immediately. We call this perfusion limited. Now some gases on the other hand, don't diffuse, don't diffuse immediately. Some gases like CO diffuse very, very slowly. So if we take in 40 molecules, it might go to zero and then it might go to five and then it might go to 10. So if we look at it graphically, it looks kind of like this. It never reaches equilibrium, it never reaches equilibrium. So how much of this gas you get in your body is gonna depend on diffusion. We call this diffusion limited. It's not perfusion limited. It doesn't matter how much blood you send in there. You can send as much blood as you want, but if it's not gonna diffuse, it's not gonna diffuse. So we're just waiting on this diffusion. We're just kinda of sitting there, all right, we're waiting for it to diffuse, waiting for it to diffuse. And sometimes it never reaches equilibrium. Now oxygen kinda of splits the difference. Our good friend oxygen kinda of splits the difference. kind of almost reaches equilibrium, all right? So oxygen kind of splits the difference. Now some things can affect this. You can have fibrosis. And fibrosis, what does that do? What happens if you thicken this membrane? Will that diffuse quicker, diffuse slower? Diffuse slower. So how would it look like? Look like this, kind of look like this, right? Diffuses slower. 
exercise also kind of drops it. Why does exercise drop it? Because because your because your cardiac output increases and there's less time it spends, less time blood spends in here to pick up things to pick up oxygen. So it kind of decreases. So all right, exercise. Now write down fibrosis. All right. That is the factors that play into diffusion. Now our last topic of the day is going to be on dead space. When organs in your body, like your kidneys, don't get enough oxygen, what do, what do their blood vessels do? They vasodilate and they get larger to try and get more oxygen in. Yeah? If your brain doesn't get enough oxygen, it will start to vasodilate, try and get more blood in. If your uh, your liver doesn't get enough oxygen, it will, the, the vessels will vasodilate and try and get more blood in. All your organs seem to do this, the one exception is your lungs. When there is hypoxia, your lungs will vasoconstrict. That's very, very important. So let's draw our lungs. Let's say this area has some, I don't know, insult and is suffering hypoxia. And this, your lungs will recognize this and say, oh no, this part of the lung isn't working anymore. This part of the lung isn't working anymore. I'm not even going to bother sending blood over there if it's not going to work. So it will vasoconstrict and shunt blood to the lobes, to the bronchopulmonary segments that work. Yeah, it will self-sacrifice itself to send blood elsewhere. So this is a very, very important distinction in your lungs. When there is hypoxia, it will vasoconstrict and send blood elsewhere. This part will no longer work. What do we call parts of the lungs, parts of the respiratory tract that don't uh, take part in respiration? We call those de dead space, don't we? Remember that was that kind of rude term we said? So this becomes dead space. This becomes dead space. There's an equation for dead space, a very, very complicated equation that they want you to know. I've never actually seen it tested, but hey, they want you to know it. So that formula is V, your tidal volume. That's how much air you're taking. <sighs> Minus what doesn't partake in gas exchange. And that will be your arterial carbon dioxide minus your expired carbon dioxide. If there's a difference between carbon dioxide of what you breathe out and how much gets into your blood, then you know, all right, there's, there's a portion of it that's not taking place, that's not doing gas exchange, all right? By measuring this, we say, oh, we can find out how much dead space there is. We can find out how much dead space there is. And that does it for this video, the physio in this video. We're gonna talk about a little bit more physio in the next video. Hope you enjoyed, thanks.